cruising here in this traffic, um, I'm going to ask you about your truck. I know we kind of chatted about it off camera there at the parking lot, the 75 Chrome Shop. So, uh, you know, what do you got for a truck, you know, gear and everything? And uh, we kind of got stuck on talking about your motor, so uh, fill us in on that as well. Yeah, it's a uh, 2005 Peterbilt 379 with a 63 inch bunk and uh, I kind of found it on the side of the road in Tennessee and kept driving by it and kind of fell in love with it and went and looked at it and had to have it. And it's, uh, when I bought it, it had a 625 Acer in it and uh, I wore it out. Buddy of mine builds engines and we kind of put another C15 in here and custom it out. It got a little bit of money into it. It runs all right. Now, I'm going to throw you under the bus. That's completely different than what you said at the, the Chrome shop. Uh, so you got to spill the beans, man. I know you're being a little modest, but you got to spill the beans there. You know, you can't tell everybody everything, but, you know, it, it's pushing over a 1,000 horsepower. It's kind of a secret recipe that a buddy of mine put together. Uh, he, I let him be the guinea pig. He built a bunch of engines before we found one that would stay together, and that's what we built for me. Very nice. Now you called it a, a C15 kind of block, but you, what is it? You know what? What can you share that it has in it? It's got a. Uh, we uh, you know the Acer came with a. Sorry about that. Trying to switch gears. A different head. So we put a 6 nz head on it. it basically it's the same thing as in the, as the C15 head. It's just SAE instead of metric. And then we put a bunch of C18 internal parts in it. You know, the C18 and C15 are the same block, so we just interchanged some of the parts. It's still got the C15 crank in it. How long ago did you have the, the engine complete and put it in service, and how has it done for you since? Oh, it's, oh, it's done, done incredible. incredible. I, you know, you know, I was, I was nervous, nervous at first because, because just like, like we were, we're talking, talking about earlier, earlier, usually you get these cats, cats over 700 horsepower, you, you're, you're blowing head gaskets and, and, and burning them up. And uh, this thing has held up great. Rain. It's given me no issues, knock on wood. Uh, more horsepower than anybody needs. Uh, you got to be really responsible with this thing. Now, you know, I got to ask, now, what do you mean responsible? I bet they may don't drive like a maniac, blow the rear end and transmissions out of it. I heard that. Now, he's right on part of that. You you couldn't turn loose a fleet driver in this truck. You know, this guy, these new trucks have all these bells and whistles and won't let you break them. This thing, you can break things. You know, you, you got to watch your gauges. You got to pay attention to the truck. But the other thing is, I mean, you see how I'm taking off with 80,000 pounds. It's effortlessly. And you get out there and start running, you know, this thing's capable of triple digits. You get out there and kill people with this thing if you're not paying attention. Yes, yeah, so that'll put the definition in responsible. And, you know, we got to be that way. You know, I like to joke around. Everybody likes to joke around. But, yes. Uh, but you make a good point about the way that the engine's built. You, I would like to think that you don't have a lot of fail safes, electronic fail safes to, to warn you or you know, shut things down ahead of time to prevent damage there, right? Uh, this truck's old school. It's got all the gauges on the dash and you gotta watch all of them. I mean, it's saying you can overheat transmission, you can overheat rear ends. You know, I, uh, we broke, or I broke several things on this when I first got it built. Like what? Uh, broke, uh, broke the cross the member in the back. back. Uh, uh, I guess just launching too hard, hard you know, twisting the truck. The truck. I broke, broke the uh, motor mount cross member in the front. front. 
and I guess same way. Uh, twisted the drive shaft, and uh, so I mean I built everything back strong. We broke the transmission. So you're running around trying to be like them boys up there in Canada at the, your rodeo du camion, right? I learned my lessons, man. I I know the limits of the truck, and I'll push it a little bit here and there, but. Like I said, this is my work truck, so I, I try to take care of her. I heard that, man. Well, you got uh, one respectable work truck. So while we're on that topic, uh, is this the only truck you have? Uh, and, you know, tell us about how long you've been in the trucking business for. I've been driving trucks since 1987. I honestly don't know what else I would do. Uh, this is the only truck that's on the road. I do have a 1954 auto car that my girlfriend's dad gave to me. It's just a project. It'll never be a work truck. It's just going to be for fun. But I do plan on buying another truck. So when you started trucking, about how old were you? And what did you drive first? I was 17 when I first started driving in 1987. It was a uh, white star. We were pulling a flatbed with steel coils on it. At that age and at that time, uh, what did you like the most about trucking? The camaraderie. You know, uh, it was a lot different back then. You know, you, it's hard to explain compared to the way it is now. You know, people kind of keep to themselves out here. Back then, it was. Every truck stop that you pulled in, and, you know, there'd be four or five guys standing around telling lies and having a good old time. People would stop and help you. Hell, I can remember being broke down on 27 in Falmouth, Kentucky, and we had three guys pull over, and none of them left until we had that truck running. Yeah, that's camaraderie, all right. You know, that's the way that it should be. Over. You got that right, driver. That's one of my big bad deeds. What are you? What are your proudest of? You know, tell me about a proud moment in trucking for you. I was up in Micanopy one day. Uh, just stopped to get a sandwich. Uh, I had 374 there. Then one across from. Uh, the cafe there had barbecue sandwiches. I pulled in there and fell asleep. And I had this woman come out to my truck. She had a, her daughter and her two sons with her. She had broke down. And, you know, the, the kids were crying. It was hot out. It was terrible. And uh, I handed her a $100 bill. And Felt, you know, I think I felt better than she did. You know, she hugged my neck. She said, I'm going to pay you back. And I thought, you know, you get people asking for money all the time. I ain't never going to see that hundred bucks. And didn't care. And uh, about three weeks later, the people I was contracting for, they called me in, called me in the office. Everybody was in there, and I was like, what the heck is going on here? She said, she had taken the information off the side of my truck and sent a hundred dollars back to me. Kind of renewed my faith in people, you know? Just like you said, you weren't expecting to, you know, see that money again, but you know you did a good thing. I think the other thing that comes to mind is, I, you know, with the tornadoes and everything that had gone on in Kentucky, uh, we had a situation up in northern Kentucky. We didn't have tornadoes. One of the small towns where we live is on the Licking River, and it was flooded. And all the owner operators got together, took reefer trailers, and let all the stores load all their food and everything in it.
went to the nursing home, moved them out, you know, with my buddy has a leases trailers, so we had access to a bunch of trailers. Where do you go with the truck and everything? Well, I've been doing it a long time, so I pretty much go where I want. <laughs> um, I've been running from Kentucky to Florida back and forth lately. In the winter time, uh, I try to try to run the 75 corridor. You know, uh, being I only have one truck, and the way the weather gets, I, it's just not worth the risk for me to go out west. You know, during the winter time. I understand that. I got to give a lot of credit to those guys that do that, you know. And it takes a whole nother skill set. They got to put on a couple different hats and whatnot to get out there and run that way. We also have uh, access. I got a hopper bottom, flatbed. Um, I'm turning right, but I got to take this left lane here. Uh, a reefer. So that we pull, you know, specialized haulers. All right, 10-4. What have you seen over the last, what, year in, th in terms of rates? Uh, how have those rates changed? Uh, the driving uh, rates uh, just, uh, I guess, over the last year or better, it's just gone through the roof. Um, and really, they needed to. You know, they've been so low for so long. You know, I mean, how many trucking companies have you seen come and go in the last 10 years? Yeah, there's been a bunches. So what are you getting? You know, if you uh, if you can share that, what are you getting on um, average load? Round trip from Cincinnati to Florida and back. I'm, I'm typically averaging four to five bucks a mile. That's really good. That's just running the load boards and relying on my contacts that I have. You, know, you, get, you have to uh, you have to build relationships out here, and that's that's what I do. Yeah. What else can you uh, put into that uh, into that statement? As far as building relationships, I mean, I hate to say this because somebody's gonna say, "Oh, you're a professional truck driver," <laughs> but you do have to you do have to be professional when you're dealing with brokers and customers, and you know, everything reflects on on the driver. Everything. If your driver can't handle himself right, then it reflects on the company, and then people don't want to do business with you. Yeah, some of that is just so elementary. We use the, the word common sense and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, if you want to get rehired, you want to get another gig, you want to get another load, you got to make it so somebody wants to, you know, do business with you. So, 100%, you know, and those are the guys that do well, that do that. You know, I think... That's one, one of the of problems, problems with these big, big mega carriers is they don't, they don't, they don't pay, pay their drivers enough, enough and they don't they treat them with enough respect. respect. How can you expect them to go out and treat the customers with respect? respect. They're out there working long hours. And to be honest, you know, most of the shippers don't treat them that great. And why do they want to be professional? Yeah, that's a good point there. You know, but as an owner-operator, you know, I, it, it's my livelihood. You know, I, I got to bite my tongue, and most of the time I don't have to. I mean, most of the time, if you treat people the way you want to be treated, you know, I hear complaints about Walmart all the time. I, I never have any problems with Walmart. You go in, do what they tell you to do, show up on time, you know, and then when you go back, they remember you. Yeah, again, pretty, uh, pretty elementary, you know, pretty simple. You make it seem simple, but you know, that's just the way that you're set up as that kind of person. And you know, everybody's different 
and you know they want to get treated differently so they may have to make some changes you know to get that kind of treatment you know what i'd really like to see is you know they, these big mega carriers i don't want to name any of them they're all the same you know they got trainers they don't need to have trainers they need to have mentors they need to find you know i mean that would be almost impossible to do but they need to find old school guys that'll go out there and actually teach them the trade, you know, teach them how to act, teach them how to drive. You know, no one's ever said that, and that would just be amazing if that could happen. You know, just like what you said, you know, it's almost like having grandpa in the truck, you know. He's out there, and you know you can rely on him, you can trust him, he's not going to steer you wrong. And uh, he's been doing it for years, or has done it for years. That would be amazing to have that. Well, that's, well, that's the, way the way it was, was back, back in the day. You know, when I started driving, there were no truck driving schools. Yeah, good point. The guy that I drove with, he made me, uh, he made me move trailers around his yard for almost six months before he let me drive his truck. <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't know why driving became natural to me because most of my family's white collar people. If the families, uh, most of the families, white collar folks and everything like that, you know, how did you end up in a truck? I was dating a girl in Cincinnati, Ohio, actually the, the mother of my children, and uh, her mom's uh, fiance showed up one day and said, "Hey, you want to go for a ride in a truck?" And I said, "Hell yeah!" And that was it. That was I was rare. You had an old white star with a cat, straight pipes. And it was just loud and fast, and I, I fell in love. We ran back and forth from uh, Columbus, Ohio. He picked me up that day, and we came back for dinner. He said, well, we got done eating. He said, you want to keep going? I said, yeah, I got nothing else to do. So we ran back and forth from Columbus, Ohio to Lexington, Kentucky, and I didn't get out of the truck for a week. Oh, how old were you? I think I was about, I was just turned 16 when he picked me up that night and I was uh, as soon as I turned 17 we went to downtown Cincinnati and I got a chauffeur's license nice good old chauffeur's license so uh, what your folks have to say you're all of a sudden you're in the truck and you're spinning around you know running miles and stuff with someone learning the learning the ropes what do they have to say well, my grandfather and my father were both uh, Police officers, police officers and then, and then both, both of them were sheriff for a little while. My grandfather, grandfather was state's attorney and then my dad, dad went on to be county judge. judge. And then he was a uh, circuit judge, judge when he retired, so they wanted me to be a lawyer. Needless to say, they were a little disappointed. <laughs> You know laws, but uh, not them kind of laws. You're gonna, you know, some trucking laws there, right? Yes, sir. You know, you know now they, you know, I would say that my mother is extremely proud of me at this point. My dad, you know, he's, he accepts it. He knows that it's what I love to do, and you know, that's really the most important thing. Yes, it is. So, Britt, it's been cool, uh, you know, rolling along with you. Heading over toward uh, Mount Dora, Eustace area. It's been a pleasure getting to, you know, getting to chat with you there at the, the Chrome Shop, and you know, chat with you here on the on the road. Uh, thanks for sharing everything about uh, the truck and everything else. I hope uh, you have a good uh, trip when you head back north. It's been a real pleasure meeting you, Chris. Uh, hopefully, I'll run into you over there again sometime. Yes, sir.